Our last poet for the evening, Frank X. Walker. That's right. He's a native of Danville, Kentucky, and currently lives in Lexington, where he is a professor of English, Appalachian poetry, and Africana studies. He's also the founder and editor of Pluck, the Journal of Appalachian Arts and Culture, which can be found over there at the book table with some of Frank and Ricardo's books. In the early 90s, Frank created the word Afro-Alacha, which has since been defined in the Encyclopedia of Appalachia and the new Oxford American Dictionary, I believe the 12th edition. He is a founding member of the Afro-Alachian Poets, author of six collections of poetry, including Isaac Murphy, I Dedicate This Ride, Turn Me Loose, The Unghosting of Medgar Evers, which Walker was awarded the NAACP Image Award in 2013 for that collection. When Winter Come, The Ascension of York, Black Box, Buffalo Dance, The Journey of York, winner of the 35th Lillian Smith Book Award, and Afrolatcha, his first collection. Walker was the 2013-2014 Poet Laureate of Kentucky, being if I'm not mistaken, the youngest and first African-American poet to be honored with such a title in the state. I once attended a reading where Walker had the entire room singing Amazing Grace. I can only imagine what we are in store for tonight. Nothing short of amazing. Please give it up for Frank X. Walker. to follow Crystal's um, last poem with a slight conversation but mostly poetry because I think one thing we don't talk about, we acknowledge that race is still the most difficult conversation to have in this country is just where, where does this racism begin? I mean, what, how far back can we trace uh, American racism? Um, I'm working on a new book about Thomas Jefferson. And if you read Thomas Jefferson closely, you can find out exactly uh, where a lot of the ideas that are practiced today that support white supremacy come from. Uh, his, his own words about African people's hair and skin and intellect and hair uh, and odor uh, and sexuality are very clear. And he had this idea that black people and white people could never get along and that the only solution was for, I'm quoting him, for us to remove all of them or for them to remove all of us. I mean, there's not very many ways to read that. Um, so I'm going to read some Thomas Jefferson poems that use his own words against him. And this first one, uh, is about his, his desire for women of color, uh, though he enslaved them at the same time. The first one is called Between the Skin and the Scarf Skin. Response to an excerpt of Curry 14 from the Notes on the State of Virginia, 1781, by Thomas Jefferson. Clearly, you were at a very private party, alone with one, when the scientists in you first postulated your theories on race and beauty and la petite morte, 
while staring at her immovable veil. You surmise that if you could just peek beneath her reticular membrane, examine the other side of that eternal monotony, you might finally glean scientific proof. Perhaps for the interest of science, you first applied French talcum and perfume to her neck and breasts with a feather or fine brush to offset that very strong and disagreeable odor. Then you place your deeply rooted prejudices even deeper inside her. Imagine yourself an orangutan lusting after an equally or exact exotic species while you probed her interior. For the sake of science, you forced yourself to ignore the offensive nature of her color, her figure, and her hair. How you must have struggled to stay both focused and aroused, a bored hair without the elegant symmetry of form to which you are accustomed. How could you know you were a man and you're an instrument, your probe superior, without seeing the sun rising in her pale cheek? Every time you doubted, every time you needed scientific proof of your superiority, I bet you mounted her road until it produced convulsions, which will probably never, ever end. That's your president. <laughs> Even though for a number of years it was, it was widely debated, uh, we now have biological evidence that uh, Thomas Jefferson did indeed uh, have five children with Sally Hemmings, uh, his slave, um, who be began courting when she was 13 years old. Uh, in some states, that qualifies as pedophilia, right? This is called, uh, it's important to understand that um, Sally Hemmings was actually related to his wife, uh, and she was very fair-skinned uh, and had long flowing locks. This poem is called, Upon Mistaking a Merlot for a Riesling. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson. I have always favored a full-bodied Merlot, but I digress. I volunteer that I was simply following a silk-throated dove song rising from my room of books when I first encountered a head of flowing locks buried in my bilingual translation of Julius Caesar. I stood back a pace in some confusion, knowing that women in general prefer being read to over actual reading. I played the voyeur as this one drew down, swooned, then gasped when her fingers teased open the firm leather covers and caressed the parchment and linen sheets each held, as if she were tracing her own delicate brow in a mirror. I lingered on the edge of her circle of light cast by the kerosene globe, hiding just inside the hips of her own shadow, as she meticulously fingered the spines of memory, reason, and imagination. When she discovered me over her shoulder, such was the color of her cheeks that I took her for a moment for a white woman. Now these, uh, some of these poems are understandably difficult to clap to, so don't feel like you're you support that particular opinion, speaker. Uh, silence works too. Uh, one of the things he, he, he wrote was that, uh, this is a quote from him, uh, deep-rooted prejudices entertained by whites and 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they sustained are the reasons blacks and whites could never get along. Uh, 10,000 recollections, I thought about those 10,000 injuries that uh, black people could not forget. And here are three of them in a poem called Recollections. Number 611. That first winter, when you stood behind the door, wrapped in virgin wool from stocking to shawl, sipping on a mug of hot cider, 
ignoring our frostbitten feet and the cracked and bloody hands that chopped and carried in more cherry and oak for your already roaring fire, before sending us back to the bitter cabins where we were each other's only kindling and flame. Number 729. Each time you added up your taxable property and recognized that next to the land itself, me and mine were the most valuable thing you owned, but still treated us like nothing. Recollection number two. Your eyes, when witnessing your purse, approached the heaviness of our tears each day at the auction block. Again, not a happy poem, hard to clap to. Uh, this last one, this last Jefferson poem, um, is kind of a, a play on words and a movie and a song. It's, it's called All About the Jeffersons, Not the Benjamins. Your acolytes point to your desire to improve it as evidence that you supported abolition. But bettering living conditions is like putting your prized violin in a carrying case or a favorite carriage in its own house to ensure it doesn't depreciate. And moderating physical punishment to keep it within reasonable or proper limits when fear, intimidation, and violence was part of the slave-making process is tantamount to using a shorter whip. Your support of ending importation served only to decrease new supplies, but not the production, only making the enslaved more valuable, encouraging more breeding of your own, thereby increasing your own persons and your own pockets, because not only was bedding Sally Hemings and fathering slaves not against your laws. It was just like printing your own money. <laughs> I know, they're hard to clap to. All right, and so, now that you know the root of all that, I'm going to flash forward um, to, to the now in the world. These this are three poems that I've, all have come out of, of April. Uh, and probably watching the news way too much, and the same things happen in the news. Uh, this first one is called Straight from the Playbook. Call the play. Decide who will take the shot. Pull the trigger until nothing is moving and all testicles are empty. Cuff the body. Call for backup. Confiscate the cameras. Plant the evidence. Say the suspect was resisting arrest. Say his eyes reach for the officer's gun. Say the officer feared for his life. Leak the victim's old mug shots to the press or manipulate school photos until the 12-year-old child looks 30. Highlight the victim's dark past. Announce suspicious talk screens. Show images of a prostrate body in the street. Say his father was absent. Reshow images of prostrate body in the street, cut to a shot of his grieving mother. Call press conference, recast officer as the victim, praise his military background and sterling record, suspend him with a paid vacation, cut to the close up of an officer surrounded by other officers and his loving family, demand an apology for the defamation of his character raise money for his defense, produce an anonymous witness, claim the video was faked, say the media sensationalized the story, show black communities rioting, cut to joyous footage of young black boys holding up championship trophies and discussing what they would buy first with their new NBA wealth, show white students rioting, declare the shooting justified, cock the trigger, take Another shot. One of the, um, I guess, forms that I play with a lot are what I call spells um, or cures. You know, it's just a way of ordering a certain list of things so that you get a specific result at the end. 
And so this is a short poem called Spell to End Police Violence. Pass a new ordinance making it legal to not be white. Upgrade tasers, tear gas, and rubber bullets with a symbiotic effect that creates the pain and anguish of black mothers who've lost their sons. Give all policemen bigger dicks instead of guns. <laughs> Let them shoot each other. This, this last poem in this series is trying to just be a poem about April and spring and allergy season. Uh, it's trying. So you decide if I make it or not. It's called Dandelions. If you can remember that, you know, big white afro of a thing, you blow seeds, OK. Dandelions, your seed head and his height radiates like a Cornell West afro. <laughs> you keep on coming and coming as long as your roots are intact. You are considered a nuisance, most unwelcome on suburban front lawns, where you too are likely to be grabbed by the neck, thrown to the ground, and just blown away. I know, not, not, not happy poem, right? Uh, one of the things that I get a chance to do, and in this last two years as Poet Laureate of Kentucky, I visited like a million schools, and uh, sometimes it's, it's a setup. Uh, I was invited to a middle school in Frankfurt, and they said, we have 20 young men who just need some, some guidance. You know, we don't have any black male teachers in our school, and these young men are just running roughshod over these young teachers. Uh, so I show up to the school, and they walk me to the gym, and there's 200 kids. And then all the adults run out. <laughs> and for the hour I was there, it took 40 minutes just to get some decorum in the room, uh, because these, these young men down front were really thinking, you know, we run this, you know, and they were saying whatever they wanted to say. And the interesting thing was that they would say it from 20 feet away, and I, would, I didn't have a microphone. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. And I would just keep walking closer and closer and closer, and then suddenly uh, they forgot what they were trying to say. <laughs> so this is called Monarchy for the Princes at Second Street School. <laughs> they glare at me with their nostrils flaring, then avert their gaze when I don't wilt. They puff out bony chests, spread their shoulders like lizards in the wild, needing to scare off a would-be predator. But I step closer, let them feel my presence, let them measure themselves against all the space I claim. In the blink of an eye, I tell them I am a man, that I recognize their bullshit, smell it on them as soon as I walked into the room. There are no other black men in this space, so they have filled it with this full braggadocio, fueled by the smell of their own piss, have laid claim to the space by default. The teachers, all young and white and undertrained, fear them, fear their hair, their clothes, their music, their shoes, their body language, their silence, fear any and, any, any and everything that smells like confrontation simmers like unmedicatable rebellion and looks like the six o'clock news. But I am not trading in fear. I am only afraid that they have been in captivity so long they won't recognize my scent. I pace back and forth and show my teeth. I lean in like alpha males do. I need them to understand that we are from the same pack and I'm here to show them what they will look like when their manes grow in. For 90 minutes, I become the father they never had. I am the chorus standing behind their mothers, the ones who are white, the ones who are not, insisting that they listen to me, to the women who gave birth to them, their teachers, everyone responsible for their futures, lest they have none. 
I am the disciplinarian promising consequences for their unacceptable behavior, pushed back for their initial disrespect, held to pay for their indifference, remedies, directions, and roadmaps for their short attention spans, for their yet unrealized dreams, but only because I love them. I love their potential. I love their wide-eyed promise. I love their well-masked fears. I say all of this without ever opening my mouth, with a gentle but firm hand on every shoulder, with serious eyes and a don't test me smile. Every time I arrive any place with a room full of cubs, and I am the only lion. See, that was, that was a little nicer, a little softer. Uh, I mentioned, you know, it's April. It's been April. Uh, just check my Allegra bottle. Um, <laughs> this is called Pollinatrix, as in Dominatrix. Pollinatrix. It's a sonnet. April plays too damn hard. When she walks into the room, my sunny days change immediately to rain. She smiles until she has my full attention, opening her eyes like a slow motion jump rope. Then as soon as I'm in with both feet, she twists her hands around my neck until my eyes water and I can barely breathe. When I threaten to leave, she parts her tulips and kisses me on the nose. I write her poems. She pulls a tornado from under her skirt. She laughs when I can't stop sneezing. Stands naked outside my window, then punishes me for coming out barefoot just to take a closer look. <laughs> April plays too damn hard. But when she walks into the room, my cold rainy days get sunny again. <laughs> you know, one of the things about uh, MTR and, and fans of, of anybody working against environmental disasters is we don't recognize our own level of complicity, right? This is a short version, not nearly as beautiful or melodious, uh, as lyrical, lyrical as, as crystals. It's called Nyctophobia, Fear of the Dark. They first came to satisfy a sense of adventure, traveled for miles to climb her bountiful breast recording their discoveries in comic strips and murder ballads, declaring mountain culture a regional sideshow attraction. Now they are back with drag lines and dozers, performing dime store mastectomies to cure their fear of the dark, removing her tops, peeling brown skin back, harvesting her ovaries, silencing her loud beauty, poisoning her underground dreams, just to turn on your lights. Yeah. One of the things I've, that comes up quite often in this conversation about Afrolatch and Appalachia is just the sheer number of um, iconic figures and historic individuals who are part of this same region, but are almost never included in the litany of what forms this region. You know, you end up with the character just most of the time, but you know, I'm gonna read a poem uh, that's in the form of a sonnet uh, from a new collection called The Aphrodite Sonnets that comes out this fall. Um, that you will hear a bunch of names, and all these names are people from this region. And if you don't know the names, uh, make a mental note and Google them while you're Googling uh, everything else <laughs> and each other. Um, <laughs> It's called Gunning for Bear, uh, with a Claude McKay epigraph. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave. John Henry's hammer and his determination to beat qua trains is a sonnet. Booker T. Washington's legacy is a sonnet. The onyx vision of Carter G. Woodson is itself black history and a truly American sonnet. When Jesse Owens leaned heart first across the finish line and took his bad man strides to the victory stand, it was an Olympic sonnet. 
The fierce love for her people and her mid-song sermons were classic Nina Simone sonnets. Bill Withers' most loving grandma's hands are the grandest of couplets. The sum total of August Wilson's plays is a crown of sonnets. Pittsburgh, Birmingham, Bessie, Effie Wallace-Smith, Roberta and the Carolina Chocolate Drops, too. Any black poem with too much pluck to be Petrarchan that looks trouble, a problem, a challenge, an obstacle, or a bear in the eye and doesn't run is an Afrolatchian sonnet. I'm going to read one or two um, family or personal poems uh, and then close with some poems from the uh, book that are about Meg Evers and, and a trip through history, a short trip for the sake of time. Um, this first poem takes me back to my, uh, I won't say childhood because I was not a child when I was engaged in these uh, events. I grew up in the, in the housing projects in Danville, Kentucky. and. Um, you know, we got bored easily, especially on the weekends, especially in the summer when we couldn't find jobs. So this is called Juvenile Delinquents. The wrong path began when we unzipped our pants and peed on the old woman's flowers with glee. At nine and 10, we tipped over garbage cans, raided gardens and liberated candy from convenience stores. At 12, we tortured cats targeted innocent pigeons with pellet guns and rocks, and worse. Pretending to be older than our green years, we graduated to juke joints, learning things they didn't teach in Sunday schools. When we were not the person hit on the dance floor by the stray bullet, when we crawled out the back door, sprinted up the alley, and arrived at the front door in time to see, to sidestep the blood, but stare death in the face, it was abundantly clear. God didn't discriminate. There was no such thing as luck, and little devils had angels too. This next Afrolatian sonnet is a, is a tribute to my mom, who was a, a character, I would say. This is called No Hot Comb, No Bob, No Blues. Mama was natural under her wig. A straw hat or her favorite red bandana. She was not a woman afraid of, but in concert with heat and sweat. She retired her pink sponge hair rollers, straightening combs and relaxers, and only used bobby pins to clean her ears or coax out a stubborn blackhead or a splinter. She hadn't been the same since my father followed her and another man to the edge of the swingland dance floor, snatched off her mail order bob, but not her determination the slow drag to the end of the song, unfazed, unashamed, and absolutely unconquered still. <laughs> and this last personal poem is, uh, is a tribute to my son. Um, and it's self-explanatory. It's called The Quiet Truth. She would drink too much at the club, arrive at my studio and pound until I opened the already cracked glass door. Sometimes her urgency chased my other guests away. Sometimes she'd be asleep before I got her up the stairs. At least once, we were both too hungry to reach for the cigar box and complete the clumsy dance we performed in the dark with our teeth. She ran out of the clinic in tears after holding a model of you at eight weeks. After that, we searched for some other reason to be in the same place at the same time. But all we found was this, this lie we served to you when I smile at your mother and she smiles back. All right. I've one poem from my father to, to round out the family circle here. Uh, and this, my father, my parents were divorced when I was four. And I didn't spend any real time with him until I was going off to college. And he's, he's not a verbose man. I mean, he, in most conversations, he just nods. 
you know, he might hum or moan, but you can barely get a word out of him. I've, and this poem describes a moment we had where we were at a funeral. His brother had passed, and I arrived into the parking lot, and he's in the parking lot smoking a cigarette. And this is not a man who wears suits. He has one suit, and he only wears it at the funerals. And he has two ties. Uh, and he doesn't know how to tie it. And he had a big white tie on, and the, the fat part was short, the skinny part was long. And I just walked up to him, and I took his tie loose. And I was trying to retie it. But to do that, you have to close your eyes and imagine it's on your own neck. And then you can, once the rhythm kicks in, you can do it from memory. Um, but somewhere in that space, I remembered, or I realized that my father and I don't touch each other. So this is called Burying Albatross. In the parking lot behind the funeral home, my eyes settle on the bulky white noose my father has lost a wrestling match to. Though he is not convinced Windsor not know how can plant tobacco or drive a nail true, he concedes his flawed results, abides my desire to fix it. Calling up knowledge passed to me from a book, I execute the maneuvers with fluid precision and imagine I am creasing and folding a Japanese paper swan. He stares at my knuckles, smiling, perhaps seeing his own hands, stucco on a high ceiling or replacing a worn out alternator. Stepping close enough to kiss, we almost touch and pretend to bury other heavy things, sewn together like the opposite ends of the fabric in my hands. Before I let him go, all the sage advice and words of encouragement that never breathed air between us spreads a silent wing, then slides through a perfect slipknot home. I'm just going to close with four poems from this, and the hostage situation will be over. Um, what you need to know about this collection is that it's a collection of persona poems, and Mega Evers, whose story this is about, doesn't speak in this collection. The speakers are mostly Byron de Lebec with the assassin, the assassin's wife, and Merle Evers, uh, the widow. And the thing about the assassin is that he bragged about having committed the murder. Uh, not only did he brag about it, he compared it to difficulty to being no more difficult than what our wives endure when they give birth to our children. So he compared taking a life with creating life. Uh, and he was okay with that. So this is a poem in his voice called After Birth. Byron de Le Beckwith. Like them, a man can conceive an idea, an event, a moment so clearly he can name it even before it breathes. We both can carry a thing around inside for only so long, and no matter how small it starts out, it can swell and get so heavy our backs hurt, and we can't find comfort enough to sleep at night. All we can think about is the relief that waits at the end. When it was finally time, it was painless. It was the most natural thing I'd ever done. I just closed my eyes and squeezed, then opened them, and there he was, just laying there, covered with blood, but already trying to crawl. I must admit, like any proud parent, I was afraid at first, afraid he'd live, afraid he'd die too soon. Funny how life and death is a whole lot of pushing and pulling holding and seeking breath, a whole world turned upside down until somebody screams. So hopefully you felt that in your solar plexus. I tried to imagine what the widow would say to the, to the wife of the assassin, given the opportunity. This is a poem. Um, Dedicated to the AK I met earlier. This is called Sorority Meeting. <laughs> Merle Evers speaks to Willie and Thelma de Lebeckwith. 
My faith urges me to love you. My stomach begs me to not. All I know is that day made us sisters somehow. After long nervous nights and trials on end, we are bound together in this unholy sorority of misery. I think about you every time I run my hands across the echoes and the hollows of my sheets. They seem loudest just before I wake. I open my eyes every morning half expecting Megger to be there. Then I think about you and your eyes always snatch me back. Your eyes won't let me forget. We are sorority sisters now with a gut-wrenching country ballad for a sweetheart song. Tired funeral and courtroom clothes for colors and secrets we would take to our graves. I was forced to sleep night after night after night with a ghost. You chose to sleep with a killer. We all pledged our love, crossed our hearts, and swallowed oaths before being initiated with a bullet. This next poem is actually in the imagined voice of the bullet, and the details are taken directly from the court transcripts. It's called one third of 180 grams of lead, which is what the bullet fragment weighed when they found it. Uh, it passed through the body, went into the house, and landed in the kitchen. One third of 180 grams of lead, the bullet. Both of them were history, even before one pulled the trigger. Before I rocketed through the smoking barrel hidden in the honeysuckle. Before I tore through a man's back, shattered his family, a window, and tore through an inner wall. Before I bounced off a refrigerator and a coffee pot. Before I landed at my destined point in history next to a watermelon. What was cruel was the irony. Not the melon, not the man falling in slow motion. But the man squinting through the crosshairs reducing the justice system to a small circle, praying that he not miss, then sending me to deliver a message as if the woman screaming in the dark or the children crying at her feet could ever believe a bullet was small enough to hate. Mm -hmm. I'm going to close with this uh, poem that is in the voice of history, so it's not as dark as the, the other three. Uh, but it also tries to challenge you to listen. Because um, a lot of things in this space, particularly this book and the architecture of the book, challenges the notion that all, these violent, all this violence and the, the conflict is about race, when quite often it's really about class. Uh, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King was working on the Poor People's Campaign he was assassinated. Uh, people don't talk about that. Uh, if you really think about the power of that movement, it's really contrary to everything happening right now in the United States. But listen for when you hear something about class specifically or about race. Um, and if you're old enough, you may recognize where the title comes from. The title is called One Mississippi, Two Mississippis. That's how I learned to count as a kid. You got old plantations. We got shotgun houses. You got sprawling verandas, we got a piece of front porch. You got beautiful gardens, we got cotton fields. You got Ole Miss Law School, we got parchment prison. You got Gulf Shore beaches, we got river banks. You got debutante balls, we got juke joints. You got bridge parties, we got dominoes and spades. You got mint juleps, we got homemade hooch. You got your grandmother's china, we got paper plates. You see a proud history, we see a racist past. You don't remember lynchings, we can't forget. You got blacks, we got the blues. I'm gonna close with a, with a, with a tattoo poem. Anybody got a tattoo out there? All right. Uh, there's a beautiful project in Lexington called uh, Love Letters to the World. If you log on to lovelettertotheworld.com, you'll find that the poem I'm about to read uh, has been translated into, I think, now 14 languages. 
And at this point, there are over 1,500 people who have gotten phrases from this poem tattooed on their body somewhere, including my son, and I've got one on my hand somewhere. Uh, so if you like tattoos, the phrases are also attached to a graphic symbol, and the symbol together makes one whole uh, large image, which will be unveiled um, next year at, uh, well, actually, this year at Burning Man. Um, so some of you recognize that. So this is called, and maybe it'll erase all the darkness that came from the last 20 minutes. Uh, and I think it's a nice way to close this event uh, and this celebration because it's an environmental poem. Uh, it's called Love Letter to the World. It tries to imagine the world as a woman. Why not? Who else has survived uh, so much pain uh, and still been beautiful? Love Letter to the World. I love you, world. Love your seven different faces. Love your healing waters wide and deep. Love the thing you have with the sun and the moon and what it teaches us about companionship, about change, about revolution. Love the mirror at your navel, how it shows off your hemispheres, illustrating important lessons about balance, about reflection, about centering ourselves. Love how much like little worlds we are, how our earthquake is your shiver, your sneeze a tsunami, an avalanche, a mudslide. When you have hot flashes, we call it drought. You once covered your whole body with ice to cool a fever. When you weep daily over our continued transgressions, our epic failures and petty squabbles, your waters break and we are born again. Love your outreach, our mutual attraction, your gravitational pull. For every treasure we steal from your womb, you send us hail and thunderstorms. When we invent poisons and no antidotes and build monuments to ourselves, you send tornadoes and hurricanes to remind us of how small we truly are. And yet, every day you continue to humble, inspire, and move us to tears with your natural beauty. Our own efforts to mimic your vistas are what we dare call art and dance and music, and poetry, and architecture, and language, and love. It is the only thing we have ever gotten right. We can't pass the course on humanity if we keep failing the lessons on harmony, and until we unlearn fear and hate. Thank you, world, for this open book exam before us, for still believing we are worthy of your love. We who love you, black, already know that everything we do to you, we also do to ourselves. Thank you.